Oh, so I think we just started. So, so now I will just uh, click uh, got it. Yeah. Yeah. So we are live now at our channel, the YouTube, and I welcome everybody to today to hear the talk of uh, Hua Mei Forsman. She uh, is a, a colleague I met in Boston. She obtained her PhD at University of Gothenburg in 2004 and follow up, followed up with a postdoctoral training at Dana-Farber, uh, working with Dr. Koichi Kobayashi in the area of innate immunity. Um, after that, she returned to Sweden and she established her own lab in 2008. Uh, and now she's associate professor at the University of Gothenburg and also since, 2000, uh, since 2014. Uh, she also, about a year ago, got a position as head of laboratory medicine at the University Hospital. So she now has this double appointment. And uh, is, I'm very, very glad that you accepted our invitation, Hamid, to give us uh, this talk. We are very excited to hear about your work. And uh, we say that if there is any burning question, they can be asked, uh, preferably at the chat, because she won't be able to, to see you. But you can also uh, ask a question, or you can leave it at the end, and we uh, do a more complete discussion about the work. So I'll pass the floor to Hame. Uh, thank you again. And we uh, will turn off our cameras, and we can turn back, them back on at the end for a better signal. So thank you, Miram, for invitation. And uh, I'm so happy to share my research with you. Um, uh, since as I understand that this is a mixed uh, audience, both the students and the more senior professors and the scientists. So I actually uh, uh, prepared um, some general background of my research and then uh, different lines of my research interest. So I'm happy to discuss at the end. So let me share the screen. So you can see that, right? Yes, it's perfect. Yes. Yeah. So uh, today of the, the topic of my uh, talk will be focused on G protein coupled receptors since that's the group of receptors I have been worked uh, for many years in the, in, in the field of innate immunity uh, in the context of inflammation and the neutrophil biology. So I'm uh, situated in the Gothenburg University uh, Department of Rheumatology and Inflammation Research. For those of you uh, who haven't uh, been to Sweden, and I will just show you where is the Gothenburg. Um, so Gothenburg is located on the west coast of Sweden by the Sea of Kattegat. Uh, it's, uh, we have two universities here and uh, we have 50,000 students and many companies uh, for most of you know the Volvo and uh, SCOF. Uh, so the university, we have many different uh, faculties. So the medical faculty is called the Saugrenska Academy. Uh, that's our main research and uh, also the hospital uh, activities take place there. So it's a university hospital. Uh, as I said, so my main interest is about inflammation. Uh, so acute inflammation, as you all know that the classical signs when we have injury on the tissue, either just a cut, or bacteria infection. So you get redness, heat, swelling, pain, loss of function. That's the classical signs of inflammation. The first wave of cells that are migrated to the site of inflammation, that is neutrophils. That's also the main cellular player that I will talk about today. Uh, so we, in my lab, we have a method to connect the tissue neutrophils with this acute inflammation model. You, so we usually have a forearm from healthy blood, healthy donors. We create this skin blister. 
uh, we can monitor the cellular events or molecules over time. So for example, here, uh, after we created this uh, blister, the exudate or the inflammatory fluid will be accumulating, accumulating in this, uh, uh, yeah, the skin blister. And uh, if we take uh, samples six hours post the inflammation, you can actually see main cells are the neutrophils followed by monocytes. Uh, so this in, in this very, very little fluid, five microliter, that's enough to analyze the cellular and also the soluble part. So that's one of the methods. So inflammation, as you all know, that uh, it's good, but you have to turn off the inflammation or inflammation has to be resolved at the right time. Otherwise it will cause tissue damage. So another part during the inflammatory reactions is to shut or terminate, resolve the inflammation. There is, this is a, an active process involve also many cellular parts and uh, soluble players. Uh, for example, we have different receptors that uh, could promote uh, inflammation re resolution, and there are different uh, pre-resolving molecules to switch uh, the cells. So that part all involve neutrophils. So neutrophils, they, that's the main player which I have been uh, studied over the last years. Neutrophils develop or they are differentiated in the bone marrow. During different stages of maturation, they will make a different type of granules that I will come back very soon. So they are the effect molecules, different granules are packed, fully packed with the different toxic proteins which are toxic for the foreigners, but also toxic to host tissue. That's why the activation of neutrophils has to be tightly controlled. So the mature, mature neutrophils after different stage of differentiation, they are released to the blood, but neutrophils will not function in the blood. So in the blood, they are like a police. So they will just uh, circulate until there is a signal in the tissue. So send from the inflamed tissue to call for the neutrophils that uh, here we have a danger, please come. So once in the tissue, the neutrophils, as you can see, first they circulate, they basically mature neutrophils, so they will just circulate in the blood until there is either tissue damage or bacteria invasion. They will set, send a gradient. This is called the chemotractant gradient. Neutrophils then will migrate through the endothelial layer and find the right direction. This is, this is a process called the chemopexis to find either the prey or the damaged tissue. There, they will use the as I said, the granule proteins that are made during different stage of differentiation in the bone marrow, and also make toxic or reactive oxygen species to kill or eliminate the prey to restore tissue homeostasis. So the granule proteins, as I said, they are already made. So they are pre formed proteins. The neutrophils, once they are in the blood, they will basically not make new proteins. So all the proteins are already made. Uh, as you can see here, the primary granules, also called the acephil granules, they are made during the pro stage. And then the secondary granules, specific granules, they are made a little bit later. So this is a mechanism called the sorting by timing. All the proteins are made at this stage, they will pack into the acephil granules, also primary granules. All the proteins that are made at a later stage, they will pack into a specific granules, genetinase granules, 
followed by secretory vesicles when neutrophils are mature. Um, the other effect system is the NADPH oxidase. They, they are professional phagocytes, so they have this uh, toxic radicals are made through the NADPH oxidase, which is an enzyme system that could be assembled both at the plasma membrane or at the granule membrane, either through phagocytosis, that's the phagolysosome, or granule granule fusion in the granules. So the NADPH oxidase, once assembled through different components that are recruited from cytosolic part and the uh, plasma or membrane bound part, then they will shuttle the electrons from oxygen to form superoxide anion, which is the precursor of the ROS. Uh, superoxide, superoxide anion is, it itself is not a toxic, but it can be very quickly dismutased to hydrogen peroxide together with the myeloperoxidase that is located in the acyl granules form very toxic hypochloric acid and further down different radicals that are very uh, toxic to both the microbes and the host tissue. So the ROS is not just made to kill bacteria. It has other many other functions this is also one of my research interests to understand how the ROS are generated and how it modulates immune response. Um, many diseases are also related to uh, radicals. So as you may know, or you, I, I guess all of you know that neutrophils can also make nets. So the extracellular traps. When certain stimuli, both physiological stimuli and also the synthetic, for example, PMA, they are very potent nets inducers. And the nets, they are one of the mechanism to trap extracellular bacteria to inhibit the bacteria growth or uh, fungi. But ROS nets, they, have also different immunomodulatory functions in different disease conditions. Uh, so the pathological role of NETs are still uh, under investigation. ROS are crucial for DNA release in response to certain stimuli, but not all stimuli. So that's also a part of uh, what we are doing which is, so what's the mechanism? Some stimuli require nets, some are not, or oh, uh, sorry, the ROS. So here I will go into a little bit uh, detail about uh, my research interest or my lab, what we are doing. So we try to understand the molecular processes of neutrophil infiltration. That's the process of, I just talked about this chemotaxis. So neutrophils, once they leave the bloodstream, they have to find the right gradient. As you can imagine, in the tissue, there are many, many chemotractants, both foreign-derived and also host-derived. So there is a complex chemotractants. How can neutrophils find the right way to reach the right destination? Um, so that's also one of uh, the, the big challenge because uh, to study tissue neut neutrophils, it's not easy. I will come back uh, to that moment again. So neutrophils has to arrive at the right place and has to be activated at the right place, right? Cannot uh, be activated at the wrong site, then will damage the tissue. So one of the activators that um, I have been focused on quite a lot is the G-protein coupled receptor agonist. So basically all the chemotractants that uh, uh, attract the neutrophils migrate, they are GPCR agonist. For example, interleukin-8 that use G-protein GPCRs 
to uh, regulate the neutrophil functions. And the nucleotide B4 uh, and the complement uh, five uh, fragments also platelet uh, activating factor and the ATP when, it, when it's released outside it's danger signal. And also four mu peptides that are released from damaged mitochondrial. As you know, mitochondrial is like a bacteria. They make proteins use the formula uh, group. So the proteins in the mitochondrial and the bacteria, they have this formula group, which is a signature that are recognized by the innate immunity through pattern recognition receptors, formula peptide receptors. And also free fatty acids, they also, many free fatty acids, free fatty acids that use uh, GPCRs on neutrophils to regulate the neutrophil functions. And of course, the neutrophils express many non-GPCR um, that I will not uh, talk today. Um, so as I already mentioned, there are a couple of uh, GPCRs that we have studied intensively. Uh, the most, uh, or the formula peptide receptors, receptors, they are basically the model receptors uh, to help us understand the neutrophil biology and understand the GPCR function. So formula peptide receptors, they not only recognize the formula peptides, but also non-formula peptides. I will come back again. Um, so that's different receptors we are studying. Uh, neutrophils express two formula peptide receptors. So one is the formula FPR1, the other is FPR2. They are very similar. Some people think they might have a redundant role, but uh, our research suggests that they have their, they, they, they share some ligands, but they also they have their own selective ligands and they might regulate, have different roles. So the downstream signaling, we know it's a G protein coupled receptor. So they trans use G protein to transduce the signaling, but they also have a very complicated signaling system involve beta resting and um, many other signaling molecules. The biological responses are still not uh, quite clear uh, Formula peptide receptors have been studied by many companies as well because uh, it uh, promotes inflammation resolution. So if you will activate FPRs, you could actually ten, uh, reduce inflammation. So GPCR signaling, it's uh, very, yeah, as you know, it's like a, heterotrimeric G protein coupled act agonist activated receptor, the conformational will change, will cause the dissociation of the G protein alpha from the beta gamma complex. And then the signaling will go on. The signaling once are activated will be turned off very quickly. So there are three main players that we are interested in. The actin cytoskeleton, beta resting, and the G protein coupled receptor kinases that we study, GRK2, how they tightly orchestrate the receptors to terminate the response go for the desensitization. That's a one way to avoid overactivation or the overactivated receptor cause the response to damage the tissue. For, one, for example, beta resting I have mentioned. So recently we have been interested in a role or possible role of beta resting in regulated neutrophil migration. Uh, when we found that, uh, for example, FPR2 agonist, this is the classical FPR2 agonist hexapeptide screened from a peptide library. This peptide is a potent FPR2 agonist. It triggers beta resting dose dependently through FPR2. And another agonist is a peptidocin derived from the third intracellular loop of FPR2. So if you make uh, this, um, 
peptide sequence from FPL2 conjugate to a palmitoether group. This will be a peptidine. It activates FPL2. It's a, it's a, it's magic. So uh, you may wonder how that's, yeah, how that works, but it's, um, it works. So this peptidine derived from FPL2 activate FPL2 without beta resting recruitment. Uh, I, I say it activates FPL2 because uh, it uh, triggers uh, uh, ROS production, it triggers secretion, so it, uh, it triggers actin cytoskeleton polymerization, so it uh, triggers many uh, neutrophil functions through FPL2, but it's a biased agonist. So I will come back to that concept again. That's also one of uh, the mechanism we try to understand. So different agonists binds to the same receptor, trigger different signaling pathway, and then evoke selective functional response. That's a biased signaling or functional selectivity. So as you can see here, these two agonists both binds to FPL2, but only this peptide triggers the chemotaxis and F2 part 10 doesn't trigger migration when it doesn't trigger beta resting recruitment. So we are still investigating whether beta resting plays a key role in uh, neutrophil migration, or is this only FPL for FPL2 if we use another uh, GPCR agonist, or for example, uh, free, fatty acid, free fatty acid receptor, can this concept work there? So, and I already mentioned the biased signaling. So basically, if you look at uh, a lateral or synthetic ligand that binds to the orthosteric site of the receptor, they will trigger a balanced signaling. If it's a biased agonist, just like I talked in the previous slide, that agonist will only trigger certain signaling pathway. So it will activate a signaling two, but avoid activation of a signaling one. When signaling what signal one and two are linked to different downstream cellular responses, that means only one response will be induced. So this is a concept concept which is well accepted for GPCRs right now. That's also one advantage for novel drug development when you can selectively activate a beneficial pathway, when you can avoid the signal that leads to the side effects. Another concept that we work a lot, that's actually the anesthetic modulation. So as you can see here, if a natural ligand binds to the site that calls the orthosteric site, it will trigger signal trigger biological response. And the palm or positive anesthetic modulators that will bind to the receptor at a site which is distinct from the ligand binding site or the uh, natural agonist binding site. The palm anesthetic modulator will bind but will not trigger any response. No signal, no response. However, if both palm and uh, the ligand worked on the receptor together, it will positively amplify the signal and the response. So this is a type of anesthet positive anesthetic modulation. There are also negative anesthetic modulators, which will reduce the response. This is also a very interesting phenomenon because uh, anesthetic module, that means uh, you can modulate the response only when the ligand and the anesthetic modulators meet together. Otherwise, it will not do any uh, harmful uh, modulation. 
Um, so we study a lot on the readout or the biological response through the agonist activated receptor trigger signaling induce ROS production. As I already mentioned that neutrophils can make ROS at different sites, depends on the trigger. Some activators can trigger release of ROS extracellularly. Some will only make ROS localized to the phagolysosome. Some will, for example, PMA will make ROS both extracellularly and granule granule fusion ROS. So how the signals are triggered, leading to different site of NADPH oxidase assembly, and also how the ROS can regulate immune response. That's also uh, one of our research interests because many disease states are highly linked to the level of ROS production. For example, rheumatoid arthritis, and of course the primary immunodeficiency patients, when they don't make ROS, they become hypersensitive to inflammation. So ROS have very important role in downregulate inflammation, not only bad to uh, activate as pro-inflammatory, but actually more in the, to suppress inflammation. As I just mentioned, the PID, primary immunodeficiency patients, which are, so we, our research has a, a tightly collaboration with a, a hospital in China that we can study the genetic defined PID patient neutrophils. The, there are many, many uh, primary immunodeficiency that are linked to neutrophil defect. The neutrophils, neutrophils either go for maturation arrest, so for example, the elaine or elastase defect uh, patient, uh, the neutrophils are not, or neutropenia neutrophils, they die or they will not become mature to be released to the blood. And also the CGG, chronic granulomatosis disease, they have genetic defect in the NADPH oxidase components. Different components make a different degree of ROS defect. Uh, and also we have this actin cytoskeleton regulatory protein, Wiscott Arthritis syndrome protein that also make a neutrophil defect. So there are many defects. We had access to different PID neutrophils and we had uh, yeah, different uh, research projects uh, to understand both the role of the proteins and uh, also use that as a model to obtain genetic uh, modified human neutrophils because other, it's very difficult uh, to manipulate uh, neutrophils that are terminately, so you cannot uh, genetically manipulate human neutrophils since they are already uh, mature, so they are not uh, much... Uh, protein synthesized after that. Um, actually, this is the, my last slide. I will tell you about uh, how we study neutrophils in the tissue because the neutrophils, are, we, it's easy to obtain from blood, but that doesn't really reflect what's going on in the inflamed tissue. So to obtain that, the to, to get as close as possible to the neutrophils in the inflamed, inflamed environment. We obtain neutrophils, as I already discussed, this skin chamber model that we create in the lab uh, in order to monitor the inflammatory dynamics on the healthy, even though it's acute inflammation, but still it's a healthy situation. And uh, also, we, since we have uh, several rheumatologists in the lab, we can easily obtain the joint fluid from inflammatory arthritis patients. So there, during the acute chronic situation, neutrophils during the flare, neutrophils are heavily infiltrated there to the joint. We can easily obtain tissue neutrophils 
from that type of uh, autoimmune or autoinflammatory disease uh, environment to study. So the, one of the actually interesting part, when we studied this inflammatory neutrophils, we found that neutrophils uh, obtained from this model or this type of inflammation, they are very resting. So we are still uh, investigating what cause neutrophils arrive there, but not activated or not even primed. The reason that I call that uh, they are very resting because if you look at the L-selecting, the activation marker or the granule mobilization marker, uh, from different aspects when we examine this type of neutrophils, they are basically behavior like the ones in the blood. They are not, uh, the, the phenotype of these neutrophils are very different from this one. These one are hyperactive if you stimulate them. So th that means the inflammatory environment locally in the joint fluid compared to this uh, skin chamber, they must have different components that regulate the cells very differently. And also we are interested to obtain neutrophils from number punctures. Uh, when, uh, for example, the patients, they have the infection, um, you can get uh, cerebral spinal fluid. There you could either have uh, neutrophils or you have lymphocytes. Uh, so we obtain neutrophils from this type of uh, um, yeah, uh, patients to understand how the inflammation is uh, initiated and uh, what uh, soluble components are present, are, are, are present there. Uh, that could help us to understand some inflammation, why it's chronic, cannot resolve some inflammation by timing, they are resolved. So that's also one part of uh, what we have access to study neutrophils. So I hope that I give you a background, both the very general background about inflammation and the neutrophils, and also some uh, inflammation related uh, research uh, questions that we have, and also the model system that we use. We also use mouse neutrophils, but I didn't put it here. So there, mouse neutrophils, and um, uh, we use that to basically verify or validate the pharmacological two compounds that we have that worked on human and how does that work on the mouse uh, GPCRs in order to evaluate the disease model or the neutrophils in a proper way. So thank you for listening. I'm happy to uh, discuss. Hello, Jaime. Thank you. Now we can uh, uh, clapped as uh, we have been doing that in the classroom to try to make a feel that we are all yeah, together. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very, very much for the talk. And we already have some uh, hands raised here. So uh, I will just uh, share see. Them. Yeah, we have a, uh, we started a tradition that we usually ask the students first if they have any questions um, and followed by both docs and followed by professors. So we'll see, uh, so, but sometimes we, the students need a little bit of the discussion to uh, get in. So we start, uh, Bruno, do we have any, any questions from the students in the no, room? No, uh, we, uh, we don't have a, a, any questions here so far, but uh, I, I have one, so uh, I'll get in the, in okay. the queue. <laughs> okay, so we can uh, start with Luisa that has uh, her hand raised uh, and we then go back to Rio and we go to, to Bruno. Hi, Dr. Jaime. Thank you so much for the talk. It was amazing. And now I am convinced that GPCRs are very uh, important for the neutrophils activation. And I was thinking, uh, especially because they I required for the HAP, the response of the neutrophils, uh, 
uh, when they are called for an information processes, for example. So uh, regarding the another subtypes of cells, I was thinking about the importance of uh, GPCRs in another cells that are, are also are important for the initial uh, uh, process of inflammation, for example, that are not from the myeloid subset, uh, the innate lymphoid cells. There are something in the literature that uh, associates the GPCR in the cells as well uh, uh, for the happy act actions in the inflammatory processes and the production of cytokines as for the neutrophils. Uh, so, so if I understand right, you mean the GPCR or some other type of uh, uh, inflammatory cells? Yeah, uh, if they are expressed as well and important for some functions that are uh, 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 regarding some cells that are present in the uh, initial inflammatory processes. As for neutrophils, uh, the GPCR are very important, as you said, for, but uh, for other subsets as the... Yeah, but uh, basically, basically GPCRs are expressed on all types of cells. Uh -huh. Of course, different cells express a different set of GPCRs, and also the same GPCRs could be expressed on different type of cells have different functions. So for example, FPRs are expressed in neutrophils, regulate host defense and the inflammation. And it also can be expressed on epithelial cells and the cancer cells. So then they have other functions. Uh, so, so, so GPCRs, uh, they are yeah, expressed uh, if, if, if I understand the question right. So all these, for example, free fatty acid receptors, they are mainly when they were identified is metabolic receptors. And it's only very recently that uh, we know this type of free fatty acid receptors actually act as a molecular linkers between inflammation and the metabolism because they regulate lipid metabolism and they are expressed by inflammatory cells regulate also inflammation. Thank you, Luisa. Thank you, Jaime. I think we can go back to Bruno and then we come to Gustavo. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on those uh, biased uh, agonists. Because it's uh, it's hard for me to uh, visualize how uh, these uh, uh, agonists that is uh, acting um, basically on, on the same re receptor and uh, with the same G protein and attached, you can can actually have these uh, 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 different uh, uh, activation profiles. Is it uh, because these agonists they are acting? on uh, different subsets of uh, receptors, or it has something to do with the uh, type of uh, G protein that is um, eventually uh, uh, attached and can be mobilized by these, uh, these agonists. So just uh, if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on the, the biased agonists, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I mean, I agree with you. It's uh, very, it, it's uh, still very hard to visualize that because there are no good structures, crystal structures to really catch the snapshot on um, most of the GPCRs that we know today. Um, so for our, non, I mean, our experience working on FPR2 and also other receptors, it's, it's mainly, based on the signaling pharmacological profiling. If we know we, with the overexpressing receptors that we know this, for example, two agonists, they are very, they both are very selective to this receptor. And then if we measure the downstream signaling pathways, so for example, the calcium, the trans, uh, cytosolic transient of calcium, if both agonists, are as good as to trans to activate calcium. And if we measure the, um, for example, if it's GI 
receptor if we measure cyclic AMP uh, level, if they are as good as uh, to each other, no difference. Uh, the EC50 value are very similar comparable. But if we measure the beta resting recruitment, then you can say one is very potent, the other either very, very weak, or basically you cannot detect the beta resting translocation at the highest concentrations that we can use. So we call that type of agonist is a biased agonist. Um, how does that work? We still think um, it could be from different sites of the receptor that you trigger a sub-conformational sub change of the receptor. So for example, one agonist to make the conformational change slightly different from the other agonist, then the coupling coupling to the downstream signaling molecules, the G protein, of course, could be different G protein coupling, uh, different subtype of G, even G alpha I, different subtype of coupling, or one is better to couple to beta resting, the other is uh, less, of, uh, has less affinity. Uh, so that's, uh, that, to, to visualize that uh, whether this applies to other receptors, uh, we don't know. I mean, also this, uh, we only studied on neutrophils on the, that's also a good for us to really see the biased agonist or functional selectivity in primary cells. Sometimes when you overexpress the receptor in, um, in other cell types, uh, we don't know if it's that basically just overexpress the signaling molecules, you get that uh, uh, type of phenomenon. But, but here it's, uh, it's the primary human neutrophil so that we do observe uh, this. So I, I agree with you. It's, uh, it's uh, very difficult to really visualize. So we, we probably it's the different uh, sub confirmation so that the agonist uh, triggered. Right. But, but yeah. it's very difficult to catch that. Is there uh, uh, any data on the uh, change of uh, membrane partitioning of these uh, receptors with the, with the different agonists that uh, they, they could actually move to, to, to different areas of the, the membrane and then uh, trigger a slightly different response after, after uh, coupling the agonists? Yeah, I mean, uh, for example, for FPR2, as I mentioned, even the peptidocin, that, uh, as I said, it's uh, difficult to imagine how it works. But since it, um, it has to stick to the membrane with this uh, fatty acid uh, head group, somehow the palmitoid group has to be there in order for the peptide sequences to bind to the re right receptor. So it's not just uh, move around in the membrane, but of course it, uh, it, the membrane uh, fluidity or the membrane, um, the movement of the molecules could be affected by the membrane, but the receptor has to be there to mediate the function. So, my, so for some agonists, there could be the cooperation between the membrane and then uh, either, I mean, definitely it's not a passive diffusion through the membrane. Uh, we, we believe that the agonist that we are studying, even though peptidocin has been suggested to get to the membrane, to flip the peptide sequence into the intracellular part, and then mimic the peptide sequence that are present in the receptor. Uh, work with the signaling proteins, but still, we believe it's actually bind, bind it's it, it's a binding from the extracellular part. Um, and and then uh, of course there are a couple of uh, there are some anesthetic modulators that could be working from the membrane part, the transmembrane region. Uh, so there, uh, yeah. Um, it's, it's a very interesting, uh, 
I mean, depends on the different membrane composition that could also affect, I guess, the receptor, uh, the, the access of the agonist to the receptor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bruno. And just to, just to a little follow up on that, uh, these studies have been done in single cell settings, right? Or do you think that heter heterogeneity among the neutrophil population may give uh, some of these uh, different signals if the cell is a little bit less differentiated or a little bit more differentiated, depending on uh, it could have some accessory proteins that would give you a different outcome uh, when it's exposed to the agonist. Actually, this study is in the bulk uh, cells, so we didn't uh, do on the single cell level. Uh, so the problem with the single cell level, then we cannot really catch the signaling system that we are studying and also the biological response since uh, then we need more sophisticated readout to study single cell at the single cell level in order to um, map that uh, signaling pathway under the uh, functional readout. So I guess uh, the more advanced the technology will help. So, so for the receptor part, uh, whether the, but for the, for the neutrophils that we study, basically they are mature neutrophils. Uh, so there that we can uh, actually check by fax whether they are uh, mainly since main, main, we use uh, healthy blood donors usually uh, yeah so mm -hmm. they are only mature neutrophils are out uh, we hope <laughs> we hope so <laughs> they shouldn't be <laughs> there you. if they are not mature <laughs> <laughs> thank yeah, you yeah. Uh, Gustavo please <laughs> hi I'm May uh, thank you so much uh, it was a great presentation and your project is quite, quite interesting. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I think I'm just keep uh, uh, asking about this agonist again. Um, so is there like a time, it's very interesting that this, the boat can trigger some of the downstream events, but not all the downstream events. So they have this bias, as you mentioned, uh, uh, signaling. So a couple of questions there. First, is there any like time frame for the delivery of uh, one set of the signaling, as you mentioned, like calcium influx, and then uh, the beta arestine would be something like that needs more stability of the, the signaling or a time uh, difference. It, could it, this be related? And then the second thing is what happens if you add both of these uh, agonists at the same time? Is there any other competition, additional effect, uh, synergism? Uh, uh, how does it work? Yeah, yeah. Very good questions. So, so actually, um, if you look at the time frame, so the calcium that we measure is very, very rapidly. And that, so chemotaxis, that's a process actually much slower compared to the radical production. Radical production, usually it uh, peaks at uh, yeah one or two minutes. Uh, and calcium, and that's the earliest events that we could measure for the signaling part. Uh, ERC uh, phosphorylation is also very quick. Um, but but the so we have been studying quite a, quite a lot about the linkage between calcium is calcium transient essential for the ROS production is calcium transient essential for beta rest for chemotaxis so the the this type of study if we I mean calcium is needed but whether the transient is needed that's uh, so we have. For example, uh, if if you look at um, uh, if if you look at uh, some molecules, that, that's just the calcium and the secretion, because uh, it, it has been suggested that uh, calcium transient needs to the 
granule mobilization and the secretion of the pro, uh, granule proteins. But if you look at uh, TNF alpha, the most potent uh, secretagogue, it doesn't uh, induce calcium. So it yeah. doesn't seem that uh, calcium plays a, a role there. And also for the ROS production, we have receptor agonist doesn't uh, trigger calcium, but induce ROS. So the only part we saw right now, the linkage is the beta resting recruitment, recruiting agonist trigger chemotaxis. The ones that uh, don't trigger beta resting, they don't induce chemotaxis. But of course, uh, the more agonists we find, the maybe the more complicated the story. It's very hard uh, to know uh, how the timing, but I, I, I think in vivo that might uh, make sense that uh, the activation is controlled in, at different layers, depends on the, sig the signaling. Uh, yeah, the agonist the present and the timing, the location. So, so that, 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 that's logical when neutrophils are on the way to the site of inflammation trigger different, uh, depends on the exposure to different agonists. Uh, especially if the anesthetic modulators are also produced at a different site, then maybe the activation is controlled by only when the cells are migrated to the right place when the anesthetic modulators are present. Then there is a full uh, biological response are needed. Otherwise, maybe the, right. there is no need. So come to your second question about uh, the, if I add the two uh, agonists together. So of course, if you add a sequential, then the, re the receptors will be homologously desensitized. But if we add together, actually it depends on the agonist. If it's a full agonist and a partial agonist, so the response will be still like a full agonist response. Yes, so there's a dominant yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. response for the one of the, okay. Yeah, if you give the full uh, capacity. Right, so, so the other one do not compete by inducing only the, the common set of the signaling. Uh, no, if you mix so them you together, they don't. But if you add a sequentially, they will compete. Oh, I see. Yeah, right. yeah. so that, that means uh, the time is very crucial. Right. It's just uh, probably uh, 30 seconds uh, in between, then you can manipulate uh, the, re the response. So the receptors uh, are rapidly terminated uh, in, uh, yeah, through homologous desensitization. And, and this, uh, I understood that these were like artificial agonists, right? Uh, the agonist that we have been working that uh, we have uh, we have both uh, endogenous agonist for example the formal peptides for yes. example bacteria derived uh, like uh, PSM peptides from Staphylococcus aureus they are FPL2 agonist they are derived from bacteria formal peptides and they are biased they don't trigger chemotaxis. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, and also, uh, yeah. So so depends on um, what type of uh, question we use. Uh, sometimes we use a synthetic. Uh, sometimes we use the um, yeah the physiological stimuli. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Uh, and uh, what about the? Can I keep going? Uh, I mean, I don't see anybody else with the uh, raising hands. So uh, I, 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 let me let me do yeah. one more question, at least ask one more question. So uh, I was okay. very puzzled as well with these uh, resting neutrophils that you found in these uh, joint fluid, uh, and I understood that this is an inflamed, inflammatory joint yeah. fluid. Yeah. So have you looked at the composition of this fluid? If there's any like negative regulator? <laughs> yeah, so of course. So we, uh, 
I mean, as you said, this is uh, highly inflamed, right? Because uh, you, you, you find the different cytokines and you find the interleukin-8, but the concentration of, uh, for example, IL-8 is not uh, very high. So we, so we, we, we our, our hypothesis is that some other unknown molecules that uh, we haven't uh, found could recruit neutrophils because the IL-8 concentration is not that high. And uh, yeah, with the Numinex gene or the cytokine array, we have uh, done quite a lot on that part, which is published. Yeah, it's, it's published. So all the uh, molecules and uh, some molecules could downregulate, could be um, some, it, it could also be a cooperation between different uh, mo molecules there. Um, and if, if you look at the cells that are collected from there, the cells, they could migrate if we stimulate them. So the cells could be migrated, but they are not, um, I mean, classical view of neutrophil migration is that they have to mobilize the granule proteins to increase the surface expression of integrins in order to migrate. But in these cells, the L-selectin and the integrins, they are just like in the blood. So what happened through this migration process? So this is not this classical picture that we have. Where yeah, are the neutrophils? Yeah, but have you tried to get this fluid? and then add it to a culture of neutrophils that you know it's activated or you have an activator and then yeah, see- they, they, they attract the neutrophils. Right. So the fluid, they will attract the neutrophils, uh, the yeah, healthy that, neutrophils. Yeah, but attraction is not the same as full activation, as I understand. So it could be attracted, but not fully activated or then attracted and then deactivated there by some cytokine or yeah, yeah. lipid mediator or whatever yeah is there so, yeah so 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 that's that's also we have we have plenty of fluids in the freezer and if you have suggestions which molecules we should look at that will be helpful for no i think the, the first candidate. thing the first thing i'm curious is to know whether it could suppress activation so if you find some activity negative regulatory activity. If you find then it's worth, you know, uh, collaborate with the biochemistry to mm. find out something. But, mm. uh, you know, that, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we try to under, we try to find the molecules that maybe can suppress TNF alpha induced priming. Uh, so that's that's something we. Uh, I mean, the problem is that this fluid has so many, uh, both uh, activating ones, and so it it's possible that we have to fractionate first. Otherwise, it's uh, the um, it's maybe difficult to find. Uh, yeah. So that's that's uh, that's a uh, yeah research interest we want to understand. Why this inflamed environment are so different from the other? Of course, uh, it's uh, it's reasonable to uh, under to, to visualize that uh, depends on the surrounding environment. Uh, neutrophils uh, have to be activated in different ways, uh, a little bit, very heavily activated, or even suppressed. Depends on the surrounding uh, environment, but the mechanism is uh, it's not easy. No, it's never easy. No. But, uh, but you're doing a great job. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, just uh, two notes on that. One is that, that since Swami became the head of the medicine, the laboratory medicine at the hospital, she has mentioned that some of those uh, uh, clinical research settings uh, that are sometimes easy to, to write projects in uh, and have them have new questions being asked, right? Because you you do have this uh, easiness of uh, getting samples from patients and from uh, normal subjects. So 
yeah. uh, some of those questions may be asked. Yeah, I mean that's 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 also the political interest that always you should do the yeah <laughs> the patient. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, and on the to pick that was the political interest. <laughs> <laughs> no, and one, on that sense, I was wondering, like you mentioned that uh, when you, depending on where you take the cells from, we do see different profiles and different forms of uh, responding to the stimuli. Uh, but I wonder if you take, for instance, the, the neutrophils from the, from the skin, right, using that setting of the, the skin chamber, yep, yep. Uh, but you, you, you take them from a patient that has uh, cancer or that has arthritis or there's a normal subject. Uh, do you see differences in this distal site? Like, do you uh, do, do the differences impact either the diff the development of the neutrophils or a general state? Like, would you have sometimes, like you we talk about in obesity, this general inflammatory state where cells, even from different tissues, uh, respond a little bit different from when when we compare it to a lean subject? Do you see that for neutrophils as well? depending on the condition that brought this, the, the patient to the you, you, you to know the you know the, you know what we really want to do is it's actually here so we created the, the, the skin chamber cells the neutrophils that we collected that's only healthy uh, volunteers basically in the lab so what we really want to do is to put the uh, skin blister on the rheumatoid arthritis patients, uh, when we get the joint fluid, so we re that w but we haven't uh, really get. Um, I mean, permission is uh, actually it's relatively easy here to since it's not harmful with this model. So we haven't done that. So what we really want to compare is that uh, the two types of two types of inflammatory cells from the same person. Because the joint neutrophils you can only get from a patient. Otherwise, there is no fluid from healthy. So we really want to yeah, place the chamber on that type of patient when we can get the fluid from two different environment places just to see if whether is actually the neutrophils on that type of patient or that person behaves in that way, or is actually the really because of the in, in, inflammatory environment locally in the joint or locally in the uh, yeah the skin. So mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, yeah I don't have answer, but that's what we really want to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, I, I was thinking as well if you do like lactate dosage in the serum may correlate with the 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 level of inflammation that you get, either the, uh, the amount of cancer you get in cancer patients, but, so, but also in arthritis, you do set, see some uh, increase in lactate levels in the serum if the patient uh, has some uh, like a harder uh, or worse, or worse outcome. So considering that you might have those, uh, both lactate and other, uh, uh, factors being completely different you might have also differences between the skin chamber from the donor and from the the patient besides having differences between the skin chamber and the uh the the fluid the the, the joint fluid from the same patient so uh it sounds like a very interesting model to to check that and very interesting yeah, I mean, we, yeah, settings so to get not only neutrophils but maybe other type cell types as well yeah, yeah. I mean, since like this uh, lumbar puncture model that uh, in the so in my clinical lab, we get almost uh, every day that uh, type of samples, either just uh, brain damage or uh, viral infection or the bacteria infections. So you get then you have different uh, uh, cells there and you have different uh, like uh, yeah, we measure lactate, we measure glucose both in the serum and in the local fluid to map that. So that's, uh, that's uh, actually, uh, yeah, uh, kind of a di direction I really want to combine, uh, yeah, both uh, the research lab and the clinical lab to uh, get more information on that uh, type of patients. 
And just I forgot to read a comment by Bruno here, he put on the chat that uh, also the bias uh, FPR2 agonist, uh, there is very little chemotaxis. So it does not seem to be a subpopulation that is responding to one agonist type or, or other. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. so Bruno, do you, uh, are there any more uh, comments or questions from the classroom or? Uh, Louisa, uh, said, she sent a message uh, excusing herself because uh, at the end of your response, she she got disconnected, so she wasn't able to thank you for your for your answer. No, uh, thank you. And uh, I don't see any more raised hands either. So I think Bruno doesn't have anything coming up over there. I think we can. Uh, okay, so it's all set, and I I want to thank you again. Uh, Hwame, for your thank time you and much. for giving us yeah. this talk. Thank yeah, thank you for very nice <laughs> questions. Uh, really, really. I, uh, yeah, I hope we can meet in person and discuss more. And also, I hope we can find some joint projects uh, together. Uh, Me too. And and Hwame, I yeah, sorry. Sorry. No, sorry that, that you mentioned that there's some uh, joint programs, right? That we can even do some uh, student exchange. Yeah. Uh, between Sweden and Brazil. So I think there is a lot of possibilities yeah. of uh, right connecting and uh, exchanging. Uh, yeah, so the, so the PID patients that I mentioned, that's through a joint China-Sweden program that uh, I had uh, yeah, uh, the grant together with the Chinese partners. So we had a three year uh, grant that we could apply both from China and from Sweden to, eat, to mm -hmm. To start that, then uh, in uh, include uh, different type of ex uh, student uh, exchange and the visit and the, the workshop organization. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there, there are many different uh, programs. I I'm very very excited to always just connect, uh, reach out and then connect more and more scientists together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. thank you, thank you very much. Thank you again. And especially you, today is the Swedish National Day, and you're here with us. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot.